Coffee is a wonderful way to start your morning. You don't put anything in it, like alcohol either. You're a virtuous parson. You don't even put milk, cream, or sugar in that mug. You take it black and think of the Lord. Okay, drink your java however you like it. I don't care. Add whatever heathen things you want to your trusty mug. But just know that a virtuous company that produces java that you can and should consider buying is Spark Plug Coffee. That's because Spark Plug offers the freshest, fairly traded, premium Arabica beans that anybody is going to track down in Canada. They deliver to our friends in the U.S. and, of course, here in Canada within a week. And we Canuckers won't even be charged for any shipping costs. Of course, half-calf and decaf options are on the menu, as are a wide range of blends and roasts. They can even provide you with rotating seasonal blends, which is wonderful now that we're more than halfway through March. You might want to enjoy something different from what you imbibed back during the Thanksgiving and Christmas seasons. Oh, but here's a great suggestion. Set up a membership in Spark Plug's Autopilot Coffee Club. Then you'll get perks and deals that some casual customer won't, and you'll save buckaroos every time you order something. And you can customize your membership to get orders when you need them, whether that's often or whether it's occasional. Nope, this isn't a stifling Coffee of the Month Club. The keys on your board to type are sparkplug.coffee. Add a slash H-Y-E-S to that address and you'll be able to use our H-Y-E-S promo code. That will save you 20% off your next order. Okay, now that we've transacted some busy business about Spark Plug Coffee, we can swing on a star, we can swing on a star, carry moonbeam so many jar, and then move on to the full review where I'll go my way, and also Bev's way. Play us in. And action! Have you ever seen... Going my way. Happy one day after St. Paddy's Day, my shamrocks, and thank you for queuing up the 577th podcast on this channel that's known as Have You Ever Seen. We were called the Top 100 Project, by the way, for nine years, but now it's going on two, I guess? No, it's one plus, I guess, really. Anyway, that we've been Have You Ever Seen. No matter the name, we chat about classic flicks, and we always spoil all their secrets, so consider yourself warned if you've never watched this popular flicker show before. I'm the guy who sometimes breaks into song and likes baseball-related outfits, Ryan Ellis. And here's the talented lady I'm sweet on, who I would never leave behind with a bunch of dopey Catholics. <laughs> My wife, Bev. That's me. Especially not that many, boys and men, this is the Catholic Church. I should lay out a warning off the top, in fact, that we are not fans of religion, and I especially can be pretty rude about Catholicism and the Catholic Church. Plus, we didn't like this movie, so if you... <laughs> So if us ripping on the movie or your faith will bother you, see ya and have a nice day. We hope you'll come back to listen to us some other time. <laughs> but since this is Oscar month, let's stick with that theme for the coming attractions trivia question. Six actors have been nominated twice for playing the same role at the Academy Awards. Really, it's seven because Barry Fitzgerald was, for some reason, up for both Best Actor and Best Supporting Actor for his work in Going My Way. Of the other six... Who was the first person to get two nominations for playing the same role? So different movies in their cases. I can't think of a single I one. I just gave it away. The sequel. Bing Crosby was the first one to do this. Oh, yes. I saw that in my research. He was the first person, well, after Barry Fitzgerald, I guess, to get nominated for playing the same part in two different movies. What are some of the other ones? But Fitzgerald was the same movie, so that's why he's excluded from this in the first right, place. Right, right. So Bing Crosby won the Oscar for this movie and was nominated again the very next year for the sequel, The Bells of St. Mary's. The other five people are Paul Newman in The Hustler and The Color of Money, Peter O'Toole in Beckett and The Lion in the Winter. By the way, we've covered a lot of these movies between my two podcasts, this one and Scoring at the Movies. Color of Money was Scoring at the Movies, for example, and so was... So was The Hustler. You and no. I never covered The yes, Hustler. Yes, we did. You and I did? did cover that. No, it's only... Shoot. Color of the money. The rest of these, we've, we've covered a few of these sports movies. Anyway, Al Pacino in the first two Godfather films, back when he didn't sound like that at all. Stallone and Rocky, and then 39 years later in Creed. You and I cover both of those, even though they're sports movies, because that was before Chris even proposed doing a podcast with me. Cate Blanchett was in Elizabeth, and then its sequel, many years later. The only two thespians to win Oscars for any of these 12 performances were Crosby and Newman, Newman was for The Color of Money, although I might have given O'Toole the trophy for The Lion in Winter, and I definitely would have given it to Pacino for either of the two Godfather flicks, and to Stallone for Creed. So nobody's ever won two Oscars for playing the same character no. then. And look how rare it is that they get nominated more than one time. Okay, the Irish priest 
premiered 80 years ago in May of 1944. Then Paramount started letting it loose around the world later that year, and it was the biggest hit of the year. It's in that Rain Man, Titanic, Return of the King territory. They were all number one at the Oscars after a year in which they were number one at the box office. But Bev, this musical, and it is a musical, has been on the scene for eight decades. So please remind us what we're talking about by giving us the skinny on Going My Way. Bing Crosby is Father O'Malley, a progressive priest with the patience of a saint who's been tasked in saving St. Dominic's Church in New York. Father O'Malley runs into resistance from St. Dominic's traditional senior pastor, Father Fitzgibbon, with his informal ways, but he still manages to turn the troublemaking church youth into a choir, save a parishioner from eviction, and turn a teenage runaway into a teenage bride. (laughs) He even saves the church from financial ruin by writing a hit song. Then the church burns down for some reason. (laughs) (laughs) And he leaves. Or in a nutshell, on that note of fire, before Chuck got there, the church was in debt, but it was still standing. Before Chuck is through, the church has been set on fire because Chuck is Satan. (laughs) (laughs) He teases them with all these grandiose notions of success, and he doesn't care about wealth. They don't care about wealth, but all of this great stuff, I'm going to save the church. But then, why did it burn down? Maybe it was Chuck. I have lots of problems with this movie, (laughs) but maybe my biggest problem of all is the fire because... It serves no narrative purpose, and it has no narrative explanation. It just happens out of nowhere. Father Fitzgibbon, the older priest, has a pretty big reaction. But Bing Crosby, as Father O'Malley, seems to have no reaction (laughs) whatsoever. I honestly, for a second, was like, did he start the fire? His face isn't doing anything. Yes, he's Satan. His face doesn't do anything in this movie. Maybe he is Satan. Here you go. Somebody said about Keanu Reeves in one of his movies, and it's probably true about a lot of his movies, that he plays all the emotions from A to B. (laughs) Or is that Swayze, maybe, in one of the movies from the early 90s? Anyway, one of them. And Bing Crosby, despite winning the Oscar for this, could be called the same thing, playing emotions from A to B. Okay, there are a lot of numbers to talk about for going my way before we get into the proper conversation, so here we go. Rotten Tomatoes. 83% 83% of critics like the film, 7.1 out of 10. There are 36 reviews on the site. Bev's already shaking her head. <laughs> and 74% of audiences. The sequel, Bells of St. Mary's, which is advertised in It's Wonderful Life, by the way, at the end when George has seen the light. Merry Christmas, moving house! It's the Bells of St. Mary's in a second feature because it was out around the time they filmed that movie. But anyway, that has better reviews than even this does. Not a lot better, but better than this. And I those read reviews, it was the better film of the two. Hmm, I think I saw it a long time ago. Ingrid Bergman's in that. And I think the only person that returned was Bing Crosby. I just discovered about two hours ago, there was a TV series starring Gene Kelly as Chuck O'Malley that ran for one year in the early 60s. I did not know that. I was typing in something in Rotten Tomatoes and I got distracted and came back. And then it was this whole thing. Wait, why is it going my way? What's that? It looks like Gene Kelly in the little thumbnail. And it was because it was a series. Bosley Crowther of the New York Times was giddy over this movie. I asked the question, was he Catholic? Because why else would you be giddy about this? If you like it, fine. I get that. I can understand why people like this movie. And we'll talk about that later on today. But why would you be giddy over it? Why would you say it's Greg Crosby's in his element? He is. It was number one at the box office. We know that. Meet Me in St. Louis was number two. We covered that a couple years ago. And Bells of St. Mary's the next year was number one as well. So Bing was such a star, obviously. He already was. And then even more so with these two huge hits. Here's the big thing, though. Why we're covering it this month. They won seven Academy Awards. Best Picture. Leo McCary won for the second time for Best Director. We covered the first time. Do you remember what it was? Nope. The Awful Truth. Oh, okay. Which was a really good, fun yeah. rom-com. One of the better rom-coms Certainly certainly of that era. Certainly a better movie than this. Yeah, Cary Grant and Irene Dunn. Bing Crosby won for Best Actor. Yeah. Barry Fitzgerald took it home for Best Supporting Actor. McCary's original story won back when that was still an Oscar. Maybe it should be again, but it's not. So did the Frank Butler and Frank Cabot screenplay. And Swinging on a Star, written by Jimmy Van Heusen and Johnny Burke. That won for Best Song. And it was nominated for three more, didn't win. Leroy Stone's or Leroy Stone's editing, Lionel Linden cinematography, and as we've discussed, Barry Fitzgerald for Best Actor for some unknown reason in the same movie where he's nominated for Best Supporting Actor. He disappears for huge stretches of the movie. Why was he ever up for Best Actor? And the performance isn't that good anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't give it to him for Best Supporting Actor. For I was matter. afraid I was going to be the killjoy here. Because... But pleased to see that you are coming out guns a blazing here. It might have been a career achievement award for him at that point. He'd been in some good movies. We'll talk about some of those later on. But... I read also that this was by far the most subdued performance that he'd ever given. Maybe the award for being somebody who really has range. The Pesci thing in The Irishman 
He right. wasn't playing Joe Pesci, so let's give him an Oscar nomination. Right. He didn't win, but he's nominated because he's not doing the over-the-top Joe Pesci thing, yeah. which is also pretty stupid to reward him for that. This went into the National Film Registry in 2002, along with four other films we've covered and one I reviewed with Chris on Scoring at the Movies, my sports movie podcast. Ben-Hur, Enter the Dragon, that's the Scoring at the Movies episode, Schindler's List, Swing Time, one of your other favorites, and Unforgiven. <laughs> so a couple of Best Picture winners in there. I guess that's four Best Picture winners, including this. One, two, three, yeah, four. Swinging on a Star was 37th on AFI's Top 100 Songs. That I will give it. It's a good tune, and it's very famous. It's like a child song. The Hokey Pokey is also a classic, but nobody's going to give it an Oscar. I like the song. Okay, fine. It's a good song. And Going My Way was nominated for four other AFI lists that it didn't make. Lists. The Top 100 Cheers. I'm surprised they didn't put it on that list. Chuck was a nominee for the Top 50 Heroes, despite the fact he's Satan. And the 1998 and 2007 AFI Top 100 list, because it was a Best Picture winner as much as anything else, every Best Picture winner that's American was nominated for at least the first list. Most of them were nominated for both lists. Some weren't. But okay, we've been talking for well over 10 minutes now, and we're not fans, but I think you're even less of a fan than I am. <laughs> Going My Way, Bev, your first ever time seeing it, bit of a Christmas movie, we're covering it here in Oscar month. Whatever, who cares? What do you think? Every so often we watch a film that was very popular and really lauded in its time that just baffles me beyond reason. I need a valid explanation for why this mediocre, pretty gutless film made a fortune and won seven Oscars, including the big ones. It's not bad exactly, but there's just absolutely nothing special about it. Bing Crosby's performance, it's completely opaque. The songs are fine, they're nothing more. I guess there was probably a strong appetite for something very comforting and safe in 1944. That's the only explanation I can come up with for this film's success. It must have really glommed onto something in the zeitgeist that people had an appetite for. We haven't mentioned what it beat for Best Picture. Well, I was going to say that right now because I talked about this last year in our Best Best Picture show, which I think was episode number 500 where we talked at the end about the biggest snubs, not even so much snubs, but movies that were nominated against other things, but they didn't win. That was the whole point. It wasn't just, oh, I love that movie. It was about movies that were nominated, but did not come down with that big trophy. I didn't really hate going my way. Having seen it again, I like it less. But I love Double Indemnity, one of the greatest movies of all time, one of the greatest crime thrillers and noirs of all time. And okay, that took time for that to be the truth, I guess. But that was a great film, even in its year. It was nominated for seven Oscars and won zero. <laughs> Also, not as good a movie as Double Indemnity, but Gaslight, a better movie than Going My Way, and a film that didn't even get nominated for Best Picture, Laura. Yes. Also a much better film. Great film. We covered that as well. And also Wilson, I think, was 1944. Mm -hmm. That's a movie about Woodrow Wilson, which won, I think, a bunch of technical awards, so it could have won a lot of the big ones, but did not. So this was shot in and around L.A., but set in New York City. I like the touch that the church is in heavy debt, big-time debt, to a savings and loan. Because two years later, it is the building alone, but George Bailey's company is helping everybody. And this, you've got a savings loan that's going to take money, and I guess that's business for you, but from a church. And at the same point, the Haynes boys, the father and the son, especially the son, are not heels the way Mr. Potter is as a banker. He becomes a banker, I guess, in Wonderful Life. But it's also interesting that this movie has a similar story to The Bishop's Wife. He's an angel in that movie. This guy's a priest, but same idea. They come into town, supposedly help everybody out. And Bishop's wife, I guess it does work out in the end, except Dudley, the Cary Grant character as an angel, reluctantly leaves. In this, Chuck, the Bing Crosby character, reluctantly leaves. He'd like to stay and be with, what is her name again? (laughs) The singer. Reza Stevens is Genevieve, or Jenny as he's always calling her. And with all these people he's made friends with, and he's really changed their lives and burned their church down. But he's also... (laughs) Wanting to stay, but he's been reassigned, which I guess is also similar to the whole thing in the Dustin Hoffman episode of The Simpsons. He's a substitute teacher that's called away to do other things. He's made a big impact on one kid's life, but then called away. I'm going to make a deeply Canadian Or the Lilith Hobo. The Lilith Hobo. <laughs> you beat me to it. <laughs> deeply Canadian reference. There. There's a voice. He's like the Catholic Lilith Hobo. Keeps on calling me <laughs> down the road. That's where I'll always be. Every stop I make, I burn the church down. <laughs> I know I'm being blamed. I didn't do it, but maybe I did. I'm Chuck O'Malley. The littlest hobo is a dog who would go from town to town and change people's lives and then move on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that show ran for, I don't know, and many, that, many seasons. And that theme song made my sister cry when we were kids. <laughs> I just remember that. It's a great song, actually. Very touching song. 
The movie is supposed to also be funny, in addition to being a musical, which is probably one reason why it was successful. You said that already about how it's the war and people want something other than down, depressing things where their friends and family members are dying over in Europe and Asia. I could see this movie making people laugh 80 years ago, but we didn't laugh, I don't think, at all. It's amusing at times. It's a light tone, at least, despite the yeah. fact there's some pretty serious things going on here. Because anybody's going to foreclose in a church... You shouldn't be portrayed as an okay guy. He ends up being a quite good guy, actually, Mr. Haynes Sr. What's he going to do with this foreclosed church? <laughs> Tear it down. Make a Walmart. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Before Walmart even existed. The three top billed actors are Bing Crosby, Barry Fitzgerald, and Frank McHugh. Crosby, Oscar winner. Fitzgerald, Oscar winner. We can take issue with that, and we already have. But the other father, Frank McHugh, Timothy O'Dowd, Constantly laughing, pretty annoying in this movie, although he's the one that gets told by Chuck why he's sent there. Chuck tells him and says, I'm here to replace the old man, but he never really does it. That is a nice touch where Chuck is sweet to Father Fitzgibbon because really it should just be, they told me to come here. This is my assignment. We're not supposed to question what, what is it, the archdiocese, whatever the hell you call it, hmm. what the orders are. But he never really tells the Father Fitzgibbon, who does figure out, maybe he does later on, but not at first. Well, I'll just slowly ease my way in here, even though it should just be, you're failing and you're old and you're not good at this anymore. Sorry, this is the way we do things. You've been fired, which really should be the superior's job to tell him anyway, rather than Chuck O'Malley. But that was pretty well played, I guess. This is where it's a good comparison between this movie and The Bishop's Wife. The difference being in The Bishop's Wife, Cary Grant is literally an angel. So God gave him the orders directly. Well, and also that beatific patience that comes from... He's an angel. Yeah. This is a human being who seems to be completely immune to all the annoyances and difficulties that cross his path, starting with all the difficulties he comes when he arrives in New York. He gets wet somehow. I can't even remember. Well, he gets the neighbor yells at him. About he, the baseball through the window. Right, right. The baseball thing. He just comes across all this bad luck, but he always has that same beatific expression on his face that he has throughout the entire movie. Best picture winner. Sorry, best actor winner. Best actor. And best picture. <laughs> I think a lot of Crosby's appeal comes from that calm energy that he exudes. He has this dog whisperer vibe about him that makes you feel really docile and safe. He had it in White Christmas, which we covered a couple Big years ago. Time. So maybe I'm not expecting as much from him, but I still think he shows more range and emotion in that film than he does in this one. His singing voice sounds like what putting a hoodie on straight from the dryer feels like. His voice is just so velvety and lovely. But I think that that comfort aspect, the coziness of him, that's the only thing he really brings to the part. He's well cast in the sense that that's obviously what they were going for exactly. But like I keep saying, his face remains in the same placid expression from beginning to end. And there's value to a presence like this, but I'm just shocked that it would win him an Oscar. Most of all, in the scene where they discover the church is on fire and he seems to have zero reaction. Maybe he's supposed to be an angel then, an actual angel, and the bishop's wife just decided to make that literal. It seems that way, doesn't it? Because an angel would realize where things are going. Maybe the angel already knows where things are going. Yeah, and to have the complete lack of ego that he will kowtow to Fitzgibbon, who's been messing things up. He's clearly not good at running the church. His parishioners may like him, but they don't give him enough money and he's not managing it well and whatever it is. And I guess it takes a hit song to <laughs> keep the church. <laughs> My initial know, nutshell, water. by the way, mm. was something along the lines of professional woman singer sings a song. The money man go, meh. Punk kids sing a song. We're in. We'll take a flyer. <laughs> Because they'll buy Swinging on a Star, but they don't want Going My Way, which she sings with the boys, Going My Way. But when they sing Swinging on a Star, the money men are in. And that's, of course, in the Met also. It's funny because I was reading ahead. I haven't seen the movie in so long. It might as well have been new. Another movie like this that I've seen before, but it might as well have been new to me. So I was reading ahead on Wikipedia and saw that they were supposed to be in the Met. And I guess they were. Yeah, but it was were. just three or four people plus the people that matter. Jenny and Chuck, and the kids, and a few other people, I guess, too, that were there from our group. Well, then but the it wasn't like it was in front Carmen. of everybody. What's that? Well, there's no audience, but it is the cast of Carmen. Well, we don't see the audience. It's no, but that was the thing. Movie. I thought maybe they were implying that it was in front of a big crowd, and it was not at all. She truly was a professional yes. opera singer, not just any professional opera singer. She was considered her generation's greatest portrayer of Carmen, which is one of the most popular operas. And it's in this movie. And it's in this movie. And they do the song for reasons that are just, I guess, because they had her and they wanted to use her. Maybe they had a little brand partnership with the Met. It is a musical, though, tickets. too. It is a musical. It's true. And honestly, 
as much as that scene does not really belong in the film and could be plucked and removed and nobody would notice, it's a great song with these great performers. I did enjoy that. I did enjoy a lot of individual scenes in this film. It's just not the best picture. <laughs> I'm just going to keep coming back to that. If it weren't nominated for Best Picture, you and I would never be watching it. It would never stay in people's minds and consciousnesses. It would never have been nominated for the AFI's Top 100 list. It would have been like a lot of films that made a lot of money because they were in the right time, right place, had the right feel, but were essentially forgettable and actually mediocre, but just had good timing. Well... Americans love their religion sometimes, I guess. Well, there's the Catholic thing, too. I think part of it... Before anybody was sexually assaulted by the priests. <laughs> that never happened until the last maybe 20 years. Wait, it was covered up, I'm sure. There you go. Controversy, if you stuck with us all this time and you're a fan of the film or a fan of this faith, <laughs> deal with the fact that's happened. In fairness, in 1944, while I'm sure that was happening... That just simply was not on anybody's mind. Just like we didn't know movie. that Bing Crosby was a child abuser. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Nobody's thinking about these things when they're watching this movie, and it's fair to just, just I was. take it as it is. Okay, you were. Yeah, yeah, fine. I think you have to do that when you watch these but movies. But you have to understand, like, the people making this movie would never have known that. People enjoying well, this movie not. would never have known that no. unless they were victims themselves. It wasn't just the biggest hit of the year. It was the third biggest hit in the 40s. And this film and the sequel basically made Ben Crosby the most marketable star of the entire decade. Talking about it being Catholic, I wonder if one of the appeals of this movie, one of the things that made it a great success, was it was one of those great counter-programming hits. And I mean in the sense that there are some demographics that are really underrepresented in Hollywood. I think Catholics kind of count among that. Catholics are a large group of people, and there's very rarely movies that are made to cater to them as a demographic. And I always think of Passion of Christ as a great example, a movie that was a hit. How could that movie be a hit? It's a foreign language film, incredibly it's extreme violence. violence yeah. It was well made. Still, there's just no rational studio exec to be that big a hit. To be that big of a hit. American Sniper like, also. I have that literally written down. American Sniper is and then like Sound of Freedom last Sound year. Sound of Freedom last year. Great example of certain large groups of audiences that can be ignored for so long, and then they really show up when they finally see themselves on screen. And I think that applies to Catholics and conservatives in general. You know, Hollywood usually makes liberal films. They're more progressive in the stories that they like to show for the most part. And so when something is extremely on the side of, let's face it, maybe not most of Americans, but a large percentage of Americans love to identify as Catholics, conservatives, less progressive people. Not that this is an unprogressive movie. Chuck's very progressive. Well, he's progressive by Catholic standards. That's but, what I'm saying. But though. it's still incredibly wholesome. Let's put it mm -hmm. that way. It's a very, very wholesome movie. Look how quickly he makes the boys into a choir. Because that was an actual boys' choir. But they're playing hoodlums who we really don't see ever be hoodlums. Except they stole for turkeys? Tony and Herman steal a turkey, and then there's that scene that's supposed to be funny when the two fathers are eating it, and Father Fitzgibbon finds out what happened, why this turkey's sitting on their table, because it was stolen in the first place. Tony, Stanley Clement's character, he's a huge part of this movie. It's funny, he's uncredited, maybe because he's a kid. I bet that's what it is, because he's a kid. He's one of the most important parts of the whole film, and yet he's uncredited. And the Robert Mitchell Boy Choir is how they're credited here. But they're reformed so fast. Yeah. He does play the character I've criticized many times, usually younger people than even he is with that, see, see, I'm going to talk like the gangster, see. <laughs> I don't know why so many kids did that, but then he doesn't keep doing that. And I think that Stanley Clements is actually pretty good in the role. And at the end of the movie, he ends up taking over Bing Crosby's role. He ends up being the surrogate for Chuck. Well, I guess Tim is, but with the choir, at least, it's Tony's to run. The film starts all these stories and either doesn't finish them or loses interest in them or they... Solve them immediately. They solve them immediately or they take a left turn that you're not expecting. There just doesn't seem to be any real central conflict. There's this conveyor belt of situations that are happening adjacent to what ought to be the central conflict, which is the combating styles of the two priests trying to save a church. But half these stories, like the boys' choir, is that the payoff that he just starts a boys' choir, problem solved, no further problems? Gave them, them focus they and they're on. focused. Yeah, yeah. And then they conveniently are there to help him record this hit song, although they could be there or not. A hit song would have happened with or without them or with any other boys' choir. It's nothing really special about it. There's none of them that are saved from any danger that we see as an audience member. Oh, they stole a turkey and this is the worst thing that could happen to them. The church is broke. That problem is solved. 
overnight, the banker just has a change of heart. I guess because his son falls in love? Yeah, well, that's part of it. It's also because the guys buy the song, the money men buy the song. And then to save Fitzgibbon's feelings about him being helped out this much, it can just be that this was a very generous donation that day in church because the guy, what's his name again? The guy who's in charge of the money men. I didn't write down his credit. Max Dolan, the publisher, William Frawley plays him. So he's in the congregation and puts a lot of money in the basket so then they can cover for the fact that he's buying a song because Fitzgibbon probably wouldn't be okay with that. He should be. There's nothing immoral or wrong about doing that. Yeah, if the money came from prostitution or from drug running, I could see why he wouldn't want to take the money that way. But for this reason, just take the money because your fellow priest wrote a great song that they want to pay for and then use and make money off of themselves rather than covering for this. But it's a nice, sweet thing to do for Fitzgibbon as well. He's still going to be the tone of the film very much. He'll be an emeritus priest of this church long term with now Tim taking over, and I don't know if Tim is the right choice, and then Tony will be in charge of the boys in the choir. Which I guess is going to work out, because they said so. This choir became amazing in one five-minute scene. They went from a ragtag group of boys to a bunch of angel voices. <laughs> how many people do you know, no matter how old they are, that can all sing well enough, and certainly in unison... In harmony! <laughs> It was kind of a neat scene in the sense that I've never sang in a choir. They're angels. There you go. Chuck's an angel, they're angels. I've never been a member of a choir or any kind of singing group like that, so it was interesting to watch how he taught them how to harmonize. I was like, oh, that was actually educational. But it happened fast. There's another story about the woman who's a total jerk (laughs) who is getting evicted, and then I can't even remember how how that gets resolved. Carol James, one who marries... Ted Jr. Oh, no, that's the teenage runaway. Okay. Her issue is, one, that she doesn't get along with her family. Two, that she wants a career as a performer. So they resolve both of those problems by having her fall in love and get married with the money man's son, who then joins the army out of nowhere. A guy who's got a banking legacy, but ends up being a military guy. Nothing to do with performing. A bit of like propaganda there too that he shows up in uniform and everybody basically straight back yes. salutes him and yes sir thank, thank you, you for, for your for, service yeah, yeah exactly no conflict at all this rich kid's rich dad doesn't seem to have a problem with this but you know this is the kind of movie where we love soldiers we have no complicated feelings about this whatsoever and she loves that this man that she just married is enlisted and is might going go die to, might die like a lot of these men die she should be worried yeah yeah but that doesn't seem to be the issue it's just straightforward pure propaganda in that moment this movie didn't do it i don't think but a lot of movies i've seen still on the dvd or if it's on tcm or something like that or youtube will show the war bonds promotion they had and i get why they did that but it's funny that's still part of the film even now because it's almost like having an ad for something that doesn't exist anymore which was a noble thing to do, but at the same point, it is a rah-rah, let's go kill other people thing. I think it's kind of an important detail to keep in because it lets the audience know, hey, there's context for why this scene seems weird to you. In our lifetimes, we've never seen a war that wasn't very publicly opposed, where the public was overwhelmingly behind it. This was a good war. This was the good war. Although, as we know, in history, lots of people did oppose, at least Americans opposed America joining World War II. More so prior to Pearl Harbor, but this is well after Pearl Harbor. So we're talking about the military man, Ted Jr., who is James Brown. James Brown! So many James Browns in the world in the history of entertainment. This guy, the singer, of course, and then the football guy, the sports guy, who I met once, actually. Very nice guy. Dealt with him a little bit in my old job when I worked in AV, audiovisual. But Carol, the Gene Heather character, has a bit of an arc, but then it's just resolved. We see her again later on. Ted is back, I think, at that point, right? Ted Jr. is back. He goes to the Air Force and then comes back. I think she has potential to be an interesting character, but then she's not. And, and it's one is... of two women, basically, in the whole movie. Yeah, there's or not maybe a lot of three, women in this I guess. Movie. This is my main issue with the film. It just feels like it doesn't know which stories it wants to focus on. It could have been simply an attempt to make something that was episodic, but it is episodic. This, yeah, but the stories also intertwine, they interact. And they seem to come and go with no rhyme or reason. And this won Oscars for the story. Won Oscars for the story and the screenplay. Dude, I know. (laughs) And that was not common. Often, or I have to say almost always, it seems, they were split. You win a story Oscar, but then something else was a screenplay Oscar. And I mentioned the whole Carol thing. It's in front of her and with Ted Jr. that Chuck sings Going My Way when he talks about how he wanted to go his own way as a priest. 
Jenny didn't know he was a priest. You get the feeling they had some kind of relationship. Not just friends, not just dating, not just kissed once, but relationship. Well, you know, the bishop's wife at least has the guts to go there, where the angel falls in love with the married woman that he's supposed to be saving, the church he's supposed to be saving. But here you have a priest who they set up what appears like it could be the start of a romance. You have these two people that have something in common. He's mentoring her. But, no, know. I'm talking about him and Jenny, not him and Carol. Oh, him and Jenny. Jenny they have this relationship they have been writing for all these years. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. They did something before he was a priest. She doesn't know he's a priest when she first sees him in this movie. No, that's true. But still, their relationship on screen is squeaky clean. But you like, mean... totally sanitized. You mean before Carol meets Ted Jr., you think there's a potential in this movie, or seems that there could be for In Chuck another and film, her. if he wasn't a priest and we weren't primed to expect nothing but purity from the film... I could see that being the setup for a romance. The character is supposed to be, I think, twice her age. It's funny, too, that Fitzgibbon's going on about the... Well, he doesn't want to be called old, but he knows he's being replaced by a much younger man. And yeah, Bing Crosby's younger than Barry Fitzgerald, but it's maybe 10 or 15 years in reality. (laughs) Bing Crosby is not remotely close to young. I don't think they're saying he's 40. I think they're probably implying he's more like 30. But he certainly seems like he's about 40, which I think was his age. And Fitzgerald was mid to late 50s. So it's not like he was 82 and the guy replacing him was 27. They're a lot did closer some hard than living, that. apparently. <laughs> right. Well, they all did back then. And Bing Crosby behind the scenes wasn't such a nice guy after all. I'm always the one criticizing people for saying, well, I can't like that thing because the guy was bad. But at the same point, we can't ignore the fact that Jimmy Stewart was somebody who followed his friends around because he was a Republican stooge. I think it was probably during the worst of the Red Scare stuff. And his best friend was a hardcore liberal, Henry Fonda. And that Bing Crosby was apparently a terrible father. He doesn't have to be a good father, but when you get abusive, that has taken things too far. Partly because his screen image was so squeaky clean. He did so many road movies with Bob Hope, who was not portrayed as somebody who was bad, but he was more the one you would expect to be the bad boy of the two of them, I think. I haven't seen a road movie. I've seen a few of them, but it's been a long time. But I think Bing Crosby's character was just like he was in Holiday Inn, which was before this, and then this, and Bells of St. Mary's, and then White Christmas with... Where's Mary Kelly? No, the guy. Oh, the other guy. Isn't it? Well, Holiday Inn's with Fred Astaire, who also had a very squeaky image. I don't know what he was like behind the scenes. But Bing Crosby's biggest movies, maybe not The Country Girl, where Grace Kelly won an Oscar 10 years after this, actually. But most movies he made were these squeaky clean kinds of films. Yeah, his persona, like I say, is a very comforting man. Yeah. He has this beautiful, buttery voice. So he's a better actor than we think he was. Us. Yeah, maybe you're right. Because he wasn't really like that. He just doesn't have any range whatsoever. But he is in his element playing golf in this because the other time, well, you and I covered White Christmas, and I don't think this happens in that movie. But the third time that I've seen him in a movie that I've covered over the years would be in Angels in the Outfield, the original 1951 movie. He's only in that because it's a little cameo. They do a little promotional thing. It's supposed to be funny. And then I discovered this and told this to Chris that he partly owned the Pittsburgh Pirates. And that's the team in that movie. And that was in 1951. So it was before he did White Christmas and so on. Hmm. But he's on a golf course in that movie. In one, four seconds or so, he's on screen. So he's in his element in at least two times that I've covered him over the years. This and that. Golfing. And I know, I think, why you particularly have the division between an artist and his art on your mind. I mean, we'll always bring this up on the podcast here and there when you have things like Bing Crosby and the Catholic Church and you're trying to get over what you know about them in real life to hang back and enjoy a movie. You recently covered Manhattan, where, of course, you had to talk about it. The movie's all about all the things that Woody Allen was accused of. And we got an email from one of our listeners, John? I think that's it. Yeah who had a really interesting argument to make about why we should be able to separate art from artists and enjoy things on their own level. You and I are different. I have a much harder time. But at the same time, I don't fault anybody for being able to simply enjoy Woody Allen movies or Kevin Spacey movies. Or or, Bing Crosby. Or Bing Crosby movies. I wish that I could forget these things and enjoy this artworks for what they are. One thing, enjoy by the Michael way. Michael Jackson music and Kanye West songs that I used to totally love. But about John's email, he talked about don't cancel Woody Allen. I think he said that literal phrase. or at least mm, He did, yeah. That. John, I'm not canceling Woody <laughs> Allen. I'm the one that's saying that I've covered, we've covered three movies by the guy. So you and I covered Purple Rose of Cairo before that documentary came out. And I said in that podcast, Manhattan, you wouldn't want to cover that movie probably if you'd known those things. But we've covered him three times. He did a lot more movies, but that's more than we've covered a lot of bigger names. I'm not canceling Woody <laughs> Allen. We've done three movies. I like, chose to do that one. Thank you for thinking that we have the yeah, ability right. to cancel anybody. I think that Dylan did that. 
All right. So, but I think we've also always pretty firmly said our standards of what we can and can't enjoy are our standards. The end. And this is also our podcast. Nobody's paying us to do this, so we're just going to cover the movies yeah, exactly. we want to cover. Well, it's funny because we're going to cover something next week that we weren't originally going to cover. It's so much more fun. And this kind of movie can provide a good discussion. But I felt the slog of the two movies we've covered so far, the best picture movies, that is. The Oscars preview show was a lot of fun. But The Last Emperor was a good movie, well made, but I didn't care. This is not a badly made movie, and there are some good things in it, but I didn't care. And then I covered Coquette. I didn't really care. <laughs> I've we chosen these here. movies. I'm programming the schedule, <laughs> and I'm not liking what I'm choosing to cover. So we're covering something different next week. Jojo Rabbit. A lot of fun there. Oh, one thing in this movie, though, too, is that the two fathers, a couple of different times, share a drink, which I don't have a problem with. But I always find that a little interesting, a little bit weird. When Catholic priests drink, we see it in The Exorcist, where they're smoking and drinking. Father Dyer and Father Karras, a couple of different times. Karras is bombed. That Catholics night has have that no problem with alcohol. I always thought they did. Especially yeah. Irish Catholics. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess that's also... <laughs> I'm going to get canceled yeah. for saying that. Wine is the sacrament. Am I saying that right? God, I am so ignorant. But yeah, they certainly don't have a problem with wine in the Bible and the Catholic yeah. Church. It's the Mormons that uh, are Puritans about yeah. that. But everything works out because Ted Sr. seen the light. I think because of his son, largely, like you said earlier... And he's going to give the church a mortgage, so he's not going to foreclose after all. On to rebuild them. after the fire. And they'll rebuild after that the fire. That had no discernible cause that we can determine. It was Satan. <laughs> Big Crosby. <laughs> Father Chuck O'Malley. So weird. Why include the fire? You've stacked the deck more than you need to stack yeah, the deck. Yeah, like you already established that they're having a financial crisis. Why do you also have to burn it down? It feels like the movie wraps up so quickly after that, where that should have been the main conflict in the movie, or... It was so strange to me. It felt like a little bit of sloppiness. Among the crimes that the Academy committed by nominating this movie for so many things, one of them was that it also nominated it for Best Editing. What are you thinking? On the level of story, it's a hot mess. And on the level of just individual scenes, we talked about how it's not that funny. The editing was really stilted and weird. Maybe part of it is that they would edit films with the audience laughter in mind. Yes. We've talked about this in like the turkey airplane. Scene. They had to recut the scene some with the of the kid. scenes. Yeah, yeah. There's a shot of the kid in the cockpit. Peter Graves, I think it is, asked about, have you ever seen a man naked? <laughs> it may not be that line, but one of the lines where the kid is a long close-up, but it's because they had to make time for the fact yeah. that the audience in previous was laughing so much. In this movie, I guess it's the scene with the turkey where Fitzgibbon is having all these reactions. And there's also the scene of the kid that does the facial reactions in one of the songs, which is supposed to be funny, I guess, too. And maybe that's the whole point. You're letting the audience laugh at these moments, yeah. which we didn't think were funny at all. But it's yeah. also 80 years later. Easy to forget that when I watch it, I think it's poorly edited, but it's because we're not laughing along with the audience. At yeah. Sabine so Crosby was in the sequel, obviously. The huge hit the next year got nominated again. We know that. White Christmas, we covered that a couple of years ago. One of your favorite Christmas movies. Did I don't know how many road movies with, meaning Road 2, Road to Morocco, I think was the first one. That was nominated for the AFI's list. And I think it made the comedies list. He and Bob Hope made a lot of those, and that cameo in Angels in the Outfield, which I covered with Chris on scoring at the movies. Barry Fitzgerald was in Bringing a Baby. We covered that. The Quiet Man, we covered that too. And he was also in How Green Was My Valley three years before this, the Best Picture winner in 1941, for John Ford. So that's a couple of movies at least he worked with Ford, who was also Irish. And The Quiet Man was very Irish, I believe. He really was over the top on that one, Fitzgerald was. Frank McHugh, Mr. Laughter on this, Tim... He has 170 plus credits on IMDb, but I didn't write any of them down because nothing stood out other than this, but did a lot of TV. James Brown, so Ted Jr., was in the Howard Hawks flick Air Force, fittingly because he joins the Air Force in this. That was a pretty solid film, as I recall, maybe the year before this. And then Sands of Iwo Jima, the John Wayne movie later in the decade. Jean Heather was in The Great Double Indemnity the same year as this. She's Mrs. Dietrichson's stepdaughter, I guess, right? She's Mr. Dietrichson's actual daughter. Heather's debut was uncredited, though, in Holiday Inn with Bing Crosby. Must have been a small role there. Maybe he called her in for this one and said, oh, yeah, I like working with Gene. Bring her in here. Gene Lockhart plays James Brown's father. He was in His Girl Friday, which we covered. There's a great comedy, as is The Awful Truth that Leo McCary directed. Lockhart also played The Judge in Miracle on 34th Street, which we covered. Another Christmas movie specifically. This has got Christmas elements in it. Ellie, I guess, Malian. Who is that again? Oh, that's Mrs. Carmody. So she's the made i guess in the church she was in camille and also some shirley temple films and some hitchcock films in the 40s carl switzer alfalfa 
who's in this, but I don't think he's really shown much in the band when they become the choir. Maybe he's just gone. Does he just leave? Because I don't remember seeing him much in the choir scenes. Yeah, considering he would have certainly been the bigger star going into the film, it's strange that he seems to be shunted aside for the actor playing Tony. And you're right, he disappears at some mm-hmm. point. You don't see him anymore. And he wasn't It's Wonderful Life as the pool exposer, but then the one who dives in the pool. Stanley Clement, Mr. C. The okay. kid, right? So Tony, he was in Bowery Boys films later on and did a lot of TV. And Riza, that's how you say it apparently. So it's Rise, R-I-S-E, but Riza is what it says online is how you pronounce it. She was actually an opera singer, like we said. Only four films that she ever made. This was her second, and she did some TV movies. Leo McCary produced and directed this. He should have won three Oscars, and if this movie was made now, he would because he'd win Best Picture, Best Director, and Best Story, although we don't have a Story Oscar anymore, but he was the winner of Directing and Story, but Best Picture just went to the studio, I guess. He did The Awful Truth. That's a great comedy. Also, An Affair to Remember, which is a drama. Sleepless in Seattle was based on that. So he did some very good movies. He was a good director, but not really so much here. The writers, Frank Butler and Frank Cabot. Butler worked on road pictures, more than a few of them, I guess, for Hope and Crosby. And Frank Cabot worked on The Greatest Show on Earth, another underwhelming Best Picture winner, which we'll maybe cover one day because I don't remember it at all. I saw it one time. But Jimmy Stewart, the only time he was ever in a Best Picture winner. Charlton Heston's in that too, 1952. The movie's 137 to 1. We saw it on Turner Classic Movies. It was a black and white print, of course. And it's another old film with brutal system noise. I'm starting to wonder, is it our soundbar? Because the movie next week, Jojo Rabbit, modern movie. We watched it on Disney+, Plus. the best quality we could possibly have. And I noticed a few times when somebody was quiet in a scene. Hmm. Not as bad, but same kind of thing. Maybe it's the soundbar we have that's the I've problem. I've heard it comes from the provider. Okay. I think that our cable provider is the worst offender. Yeah, but I'm saying Jojo Rabbit was through Disney Plus, not a cable oh, yeah, provider. Yeah, but it wasn't as bad as going that No, way. I did notice it, surprisingly. Lionel Linden shot the movie. He shot Manchurian Candidate, one of the great movies of all time, also black and white, and Around the World in 80 Days, another Best Picture winner that I think is very underwhelming. John Seitz, or Seitz, I don't know how you pronounce the name, but it's S-E-I-T-Z. He was uncredited on this, but worked with Wilder a lot. I think maybe possibly the same years this did Double Indemnity. Another black and white film, too. The editor, Leroy Stone, or Leroy Stone, who you think should not have been nominated, you're probably right. He was uncredited on Duck Soup and died of a heart attack just five years after this. And the composer, Robert Emmett Dolan, was uncredited also. He worked on the sequel and also Holiday Inn before this for Bing Crosby. You said you don't like the editing. I think the movie looked pretty good. And the music, well, the songs, I think, are solid, at least. Going my way, I don't care about that. I forgot that was actually a song in this, because it's been so long since I saw it. such a forgettable song. But Swinging on a Star has truly lasted. It is in the top 40 on the FI songs list. I'm not going to argue with that. I think it's a pretty good song. And we talked about a TV show from the 80s, was it? Or even, it must have been the 80s, not the 90s. That you and I both watched. You looked it up. It's called Out of This World. That's what it is, right. Yeah, and Swinging on a Star was their theme song. You and I both really remembered that. So the song must make an impression. But it was a cover of that Bing Crosby, right? Well, no, no, also, it wasn't Bing Crosby. Isn't it also Ethel Merman that did it? Would you like to swing on a star? You're asking me. <laughs> I think that she did a cover that I actually know better than I know this. I think it's her, Ethel Merman. I believe that's true. But anyway, yeah, we don't love almost anything about this technically, but I think at least it looks all right. Yeah, I agree. It was a well-made film. Well, you don't love the editing, so it's not that well-made. <sighs> no, I It's very to... set-bound as well. Yeah, I mean, like most films made in the 40s probably were so it's typical studio film in that way the sets are well made so that helps and as much as i may forgive the editing for some poorly timed jokes that just don't translate because we're not watching it with the 40s audience the story editing in general is really poorly executed Mm -hmm. what happens next we'll forget about the sequel bing crosby leaves and goes off with ingrid bergman to do something else somewhere else Maybe goes back to St. Louis, I don't know. But we'll speculate, I will, that Tony Scaponi unveils his grandmaster plan to get in good with high-ranking religious people, gain their trust, then rob the church blind. (laughs) We also won't speculate about just how big the clergy's eyes got when all those young boys started hanging around the church so much. All right, then, last thoughts on the Best Picture winner from 80 years ago, Going My Way. I think that the label of Best Picture has really set a bar that made it impossible for me to enjoy any of the merits that this film does have. But it is a comforting, easy film with a charismatic star. It just had no business winning Best Picture. I have to return to my theory that in 1944, Americans were just so rattled by the ongoing war that they couldn't resist this comfort food, even though it isn't even good, let alone great. 
We never got wrapped up in the story. I didn't really give a poop. And I started forgetting about the movie an hour after we watched it. Thank God for notes and Wikipedia to remind me of the story earlier today. To know this won all those awards while this movie's polar opposite, The Great Double Indemnity, won nothing, will never stop galling me. I agree with you on that for sure. That's not this movie's fault, and maybe we shouldn't have watched it that way with that mindset, but we did. That's maybe the way the Academy does a disservice to movies that it awards that it shouldn't. Especially seven Oscars. I think about how years from now people are going to go back and watch Coda with a certain level of expectations yeah. and be like, how the hell did this movie win Best Picture? At least only won three. If you just came across it because you were interested in the subject matter and you had lower expectations, you'd nice be movie. far more delighted it's by inclusive. it. Yeah, exactly. It's just such a sweet movie, but... Nothing special. It's like a Ritz cracker of a movie. I love Ritz crackers, but you don't give it a Michelin star. Well, Eve, I've had to apologize to her before. I think I did that last year in the Best Best Pictures, if she's even listening to us anymore, because I did rip on How Green Is My Valley. Citizen Kane should have won that year. And then this was three years later, and Dublin Dennity should have won this year. And the Irish film that probably should have won was The Quiet Man, because that's definitely better than The Greatest Show on Earth. They were 1952. Yeah. How Green Was My Valley, it's a better movie than this one. I mean, maybe we're going to cover that, but we don't have that available. So availability is part of the why we do this. So that was how we saw Going My Way. Thanks for taking part in this one. Although, sorry if you're a big fan. We just crapped all over it. <laughs> <laughs> if you are a fan, what are you still doing here? Maybe you should be nominated for the AFI's Top 50 Heroes for sticking with us. <laughs> I'll be back on the Yeti mic on Friday, although I'm still not 100% on what movie I'll be covering. I think it's going to be You Can't Take It With You. I started taking more thorough notes a couple of hours ago after I worked on the notes for this movie. I think that's the Jimmy Stewart Oscar winner from 1938. Whatever it's going to be, I will do something Oscars related on Friday, the 22nd of March. When Bev is back here next Monday, we'll go from religious sincerity and supposed humor to a genuinely funny film about Nazis, love, family, the horrible cost of bigotry and war, and Taika Waititi's Jojo Rabbit. Jojo didn't win Best Picture, even though this is really Best Picture Month, but then Coquette wasn't a Best Picture winner either, and I covered that a few weeks ago. Parasite won that year. We covered that. But Jojo did win a trophy for Taika Screenplay, and it was also one of my two or three favorite movies. I guess, actually, I think I said my favorite movie of 2019 when we talked about this years ago. So the coming attractions trivia question for Jojo Rabbit, and it's not an opinion question, even though it's going to sound like one. Name me one child performance in the history of cinema that's funnier than what Archie Yates does, Archie Yates in JoJo. I don't think you can do it, but I invite you to try. You, the audience, anybody. One funnier child performance. And as we said when we watched it last night, the kids got three zingers right in a row. In like 10 seconds. <laughs> All right, so for our answer to that question, check out next week's podcast about JoJo Rabbit. You already know how to find our podcast, so let me remind you to favorite or subscribe wherever you listen, which is also where you can find our archive of hundreds of episodes that are available for free. While you're there, please leave us a rating and a review. That is a great way to support the podcast. We're both on Twitter, or X. Twix. <laughs> I'm at Bev Ellis Ellis, and Ryan is at MovieFiend51. You can also reach us by email. That's how we heard from John, and we loved your email. I hope we weren't hard on you there because we always love hearing from everybody. We owe you a better response. But our email address is have you ever seen podcast at gmail.com. We, by the way, record this episode on the 26th of February. Maybe we will have responded to John in the email before this actually goes up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He actually wrote really insightful, great stuff. And honest to God, Hearing from listeners is one of the biggest perks of doing this podcast. I can't tell you how much it means to us. But I didn't cancel reject. Woody Allen. <laughs> and I wasn't planning we to. We don't have the power to cancel I anybody. hate that expression anyway. <laughs> you can also find our podcast on YouTube. Our channel is at H-Y-E-S Ellis. And to enjoy freshly roasted premium coffee delivered straight to you in Canada or the U.S., please go to sparkplug.coffee slash H-Y-E-S and enjoy a 20% discount. I'm going to go swing on more stars and burn down a few more churches. I'm Satan, didn't you know? My name is Father Chuck O'Malley. And cut. <laughs>